Hello, hello, hello. There we go. How are, how are you? <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> That's all right. I was on my own for about 20 seconds. It was very no, exciting. I do apologise. I do apologise. A bit of teething trouble. I think that's to be expected. Um, yeah, of course. Um, this is all very exciting. Um, yeah. So there's just a bit, a bit of housekeeping, I think, just for, just for everyone to be aware, everyone joining us. Hello, everyone. Uh, we're up to, it looks like, 85 people watching, which is very, very exciting. Great. Um, what I do have to do is try and we've got a bit of... Um, Let's try and get, uh, we're working, it's, this is all happening live, folks. It's very exciting. Um, <laughs> we've got to try and get order in here at some point because we've. Uh, I've had to come in and kick order out, sadly, just because, just so we can get started. Um, uh, well, welcome, M Bolt to BSC. Uh, this is uh, our first uh, live um, uh, online Q&A, which is very exciting. Um, how are, whereabouts are you? Not you don't have to give us your address, Eben, but whereabouts are you in the world? It's in the BSC book, anyway. So. <laughs> um, I'm in I'm in Whitney, uh, Oxfordshire, so just like an hour west of uh, of London. So fantastic. Middle of nowhere, which is quite a nice place to be right now, actually. Cool. And how is it? Uh, is it? It's, it sounds like it's pretty quiet around there. Yeah, incredibly quiet. Yeah, yeah. It's just it's just on the edge of the Cotswolds, so so right. you can walk into the Cotswolds, which is we're very lucky. It's very nice. Fantastic. Um, and that we're, but despite everything, uh, all the craziness in the in the world, we're blessed with with really quite beautiful weather. So yeah, at least we've we've got that. Yeah, exactly. We've got a, a small little garden we can sit in, so it's yeah, we're trying to enjoy it. Um, yes. Yeah, it's like early retirement. It's sort of forced time off. Well, Renaissance. I mean, this that, 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 that's a whole Q and A in itself, isn't it? I mean, we could spend hours talking yeah, about it. Positive things, but yeah, yeah, we are. It's uh, these are crazy times for all of us. So I hope everyone out there is um is, is you know staying staying sane and um and is uh, 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 healthy and safe. That's that's the main thing. So uh, we're here to talk about a project that you did. Um, when did you shoot this? Just out of interest. Just uh, the... um, we started shooting, I believe, in April 2019. I think it was April, um, and we shot until I want to say September. It was August or September. Okay. Cool. Um, so yeah, it, I was on the project for 11 months total, um, right. which is you know a long time in our game. Um, yes. Six months prep, five months shoot. Uh, wow, that's so, a long yeah. time. It was. So yeah, just to, just to be clear, we're talking about a project that's actually it's 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 not long gone to air. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. The the finale, I think, was two weeks ago now. A week ago okay, now. Cool. Yeah. So we're talking about the project Avenue Five, which was for Sky HBO. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. And it was how many episodes and how long were they? And uh, yeah, so it was well, actually, uh, to be candid, it was ten uh, half hour episodes, but we had. Okay. A, fire which i'm sure we'll talk about later right um, with a big fire at least and lost it lost p stage um so uh, part of the fallout from that was we lost an episode so it ended up with nine 30 minute episodes for hbo okay. yeah yeah it was very much a, it, i'd say it was very much an hbo show um sky have a sort of distribution deal but it was you know it was an hbo project in terms right. of who, was, who we were talking to um yeah I mean, it was clearly an, an, an enormous undertaking in terms of its scale uh, and ambition because there's all for, uh, I mean, you did some location work, but there's, I mean, you, you built, how, what was the percentage of build, would you say? Well, it, yeah, I mean, originally the percentage of build was something like, you know, 99%. I mean, it really right. was. We had four stages at Leavesden um, and uh, pretty much everything was going to be built. Um, it was the fire that actually forced us out on location. Um, so for the two episodes I sent, the reason, the reason I wanted to send out the last two was episode nine was where we were sort of forced out into location. So that, that's when we had to kind of think on our feet. and Right reinvent locations and, and conceive them as potentially being on the spaceship but yeah the actual um most of it was leaves and studios they were there um for about nine months before i even started and then six months with me so the reason i came on so early was these sets you know we were building a spaceship every single you know molecule of, of light and texture and everything else was built so sure. i needed to get in there as early as possible to to sort of start lighting um in the sort of 
conception uh, stage of, of sure. what it was going to be, you know, uh, integrating light fixtures and everything else. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's the, lots to talk about uh, in, in terms of that. So how, uh, I mean, it was the first time you'd worked with, um, because you worked with the new gaffers, right? And with Simon Bowles, obviously. So it's the kind of two uh, two yeah. lines to talk about there in terms of or how you integrated working with the new gaffer and and like you say, is that you were in a, a relatively early stage to build in everything. So do, obviously, working with production design is pretty key on that. So how how did that? Did you know Simon and did you uh, and uh, and who's your gaffer on it? Uh, so I had two gaffers. I had Jonathan Spencer did uh, prep and the pilot with me. Um, and then uh, Aaron, AJ Walters, sort of took over for the rest of the series. Um, right. so he went to go to one of the Game of Thrones prequels. Um, so right. yeah, he did the prep and the pilot and then Aaron took over. So it's pretty much a 50-50 split between the two of them in the end. Right. Um, well, and have no. you had you worked with uh, worked with either of those before? I don't know what you're. Yes, yeah, so I work. I've worked with um, AJ Walters um, for years now. Actually, I guess sort of seven years. He he's um, you know one of the the Walters clan. So um, right. me and Gavin, I think a lot of people know. Um, yep. And AJ was their sort of younger brother who sort of sparked for them um, for for years and years. And I, I'm pretty sure uh, AJ actually gaffered his first feature film with me. I think called. Uh, the Hoarder, uh, which right. was quite an experience uh, <laughs> seven years ago. Um, and yeah, I, I work with him as often as I can. I mean, you know, you know what it's like. We, we work internationally a lot and, and, you know, I'm not at the stage where I'm able to bring gaffers with me. So I, I've, sure. I've been really lucky actually to work with so many great gaffers all around the world. But um, yeah, AJ is my, my London gaffer. Um, and um, yeah, in, in terms of the team, you know, when I was interviewed, uh, so when I first, uh, it came through my agent, um, the, the job initially, and um, I, I went to Leavesden to interview, and it was a sort of a three-hour interview. I'd never really done anything like that before. It was an interview with Armando and the producers. Uh, then we went to, uh, to meet Simon, the production designer, who I hadn't met before. We walked around his office through all the concepts, all the design, excuse me, all the designs, um, and, uh, and then... It, we continued the interview over lunch with the producers. So it, really, it was a real sort of stage by stage process of, mm. of talking through everything and how we do things. So, um, no, for, for a lot of a lot of, of the collaborations were sort of born on this project actually, which was yeah unique, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So, sorry, how long how long had Simon been up and running with in terms of the design? I think nine months, something like that. So right. over, yeah, somewhere between half a year and a year he had been on it for. Um, okay. And they'd got to the point where they wanted to start building um, and they, they, they needed me to come in with a gaffer uh, as early as possible to just start talking about fixtures and, and how we'd integrate light into the set. Um, sure. So, yeah. That's... I mean, and that's key with that sort of stuff, isn't it? Because you literally, if you're building it all in, I mean, and you were. So, from what I understand, um, I mean, I, I, and from what you've told me uh, about the way it that um, that Armando likes to work. I mean, we should talk about him a little bit before. Yeah. I mean, he's uh, Armando Iannucci has got um, you know a fairly well known uh, history of some seminal British TV comedy, um, and this is. Um, but he's also then went on and he did Veep and has sort of worked a bit internationally on fairly large scale. And plus, he. Um, uh the film what was the film that was based on um in the loop thick of it in the loop of course yes that um that jamie kenny shot yeah um yeah. which was fantastic so he's kind of and he's moved into his death of stalin and various things and david coffee which he did with That's zach right. nicholson That's which right. were fantastic bits of work but it's that um I mean, this was a, the, for you, how did you, what brought you in on the project and what, um, what you, what did you, um, what drew you to it uh, and um, what, um, I mean, and how was it different, do you think, from TV and how did that, that sort of that collaboration kind of work? Yeah, so, so when it first came up, I kind of didn't know what to think because I'm, I'm a huge fan of his work. Um, like most people are, I think he's a genius. Um, but in terms of who I am as a cinematographer, or who I'm trying to be, uh, you know, I, I tend to shoot single camera drama, uh, you know, films, uh, TV series, and they're all, it's all quite serious, to be honest. So I haven't done comedy before, and I definitely haven't done multi-camera before. I mean, you know, 
I've done two, three cameras for action scenes, that kind of mm. thing. But I tend to like to operate. I tend to like to shoot single camera, and I tend to like to light, you know, and, and, and sort of be expressive with lighting, uh, you know, like we all do. So when it kind of came up that it was Armando Iannucci comedy TV multicam, my in, my initial reaction was, well, that's why did why would he want to speak to me, you know? Um, and what I sort of came to, to, to understand, I mean, I read the script, I thought it's hilarious. I went to this meeting and I sort of saw the scale and ambition visually for the project. And speaking to Armando, he wanted to step outside of his comfort zone. And he, to be honest, he kind of wanted, you know, he wanted his cake and tweet it too. He wanted the flexibility to have multi-camera shooting, no rehearsals, just sort of essentially make it up as you go along, but you know, in a, in a, in a good way. And I don't say that. Yeah. I think we know, we all know quite a few directors like that. Yes. Yeah, he wanted freedom <laughs> and flexibility and all those beautiful things. And it is ultimately comedy. You know, that, the thing about this project is that it all whittles down to the fact, is it funny or not? You know, it, it is a comedy. Yes, absolutely. So my job became, how can I, how can I facilitate that environment for him and the actors to just do what they do, whilst at the same time, um, trying to give him something a bit more cinematic, a bit more visually interesting, and something that for myself, I, I don't feel like I'm just sort of going, well, it's not about the visuals, let's just have some fun. I, you know, I wanted to really, I was sort of interested in, how can I do it? Can I shoot? Can I cross shoot? Because that's just a thing I've done so rarely is get two mm. cameras and properly cross shoot. I, I do every every excuse that we all have of course. why we shouldn't <laughs> do that, you know, and I, I'm well versed in those excuses. So to, to actually go, OK, not just cross shoot, but let's do that twice over. Let's get four cameras going. I was sort of I was interested in how would I approach that? How, like, I don't know anything about that way of shooting that, that world. So mm. what if I just took what I do know, the way I do work, and sort of put myself into that environment right out of my comfort zone. And I wonder what that would be like. I wonder what that would look like. So that's kind of, I came around to this just idea of, um, of sort of pushing myself and just trying something completely out of the box and different and new. Um, and I thought that even if I sort of fail, it will be interesting because I'm not going to just do what I'm supposed to do. I'm not going to just you know, Google yeah. how to light a multicam comedy and, and do that. Do you know what I mean? I wanted mm. to just sort of go, what's my version of that? And how can I kind of bring a little bit of what I like in cinematography and slip it in under the radar whilst not getting in the way? So that, sure. that became the kind of personal um, ambition. You're right, your aim. So yeah. was there, I mean, there's not many uh, uh, um, science not 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 many sitcoms that are set in space so what were your what were your references and then how like how how uh involved did uh armando have with with your side of it so you said you kind of, you kind of need to slip some of the cinematography in under the comedy which is kind of right i mean it's, it shouldn't lead it ever yeah. but that but but so what were your references and then how did you did, did you talk to him about that or was he just not kind of interested yeah no he was i mean he's very cine literate uh he, he's obviously an incredibly smart man he's very cine literate um what, what we again what we didn't want to do was reference anything else that was directly comparable so there are all kinds of great uh sci-fi all kinds of great comedy but we sort of tried to you know we, we we just wanted to sort of find something that was our own thing interestingly and this you might well you will laugh at this but um, the, the one film he did mention really early on was Interstellar, and it, you know it, it was like uh, you've got you've got there are IMAX. worse references. Than, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like yeah. you've got IMAX single camera yeah. all the way, like the most. Yeah, composed, you know you've got Christopher Nolan, you've got Armando Iannucci, and what's in the middle? And I did, <laughs> I did actually really like that because it was like okay, he's just he wants cinema and he wants that sort of you know interstellar does have these moments of kind of verite cinema where mm. it feels quite handheld it's relatively grainy at times you know yeah. captured lighting all that kind of thing so i just sort of i put that into my kind of box of of, of references and we also looked at, at color a lot um you know sci-fi does tend to be relatively desaturated you know stereotypically quite cool tones and yeah we wanted to push against that we were like well let's go rich let's go warm let's go colorful um, and, you know, th these conversations would just sort of flow. I mean, it was, me it was very much a triangle of me, the production designer and Armando, as it should be, of, of what about this, what about this, what about this? And we just sort of mm -hmm. bounced these ideas around and that just kind of formed 
something. Um, and so, yeah, there were a few challenges. I mean, I, I a, a few things that I sort of introduced into the mix that I wanted to just have some, I quite like rules. I quite like sort of having high concepts or rules. So I wanted to be able to distinguish different parts of the ship. So we had the sort of the front of the ship, which is the kind of vulgar, slick casino. Um, I wanted to have that as one world. Then we've got the back of the ship, which is the sort of more grungy Ridley Scott alien kind of uh, you know, workings of the ship. And then we've got Earth, um, people back on Earth, Mission Control. Wow. Um, and so I, I, I really wanted to have a different feel for each of those environments, um, to, you know, based on lighting, based on set design, obviously, and based on operating. You know, we, we did go into zoom lenses and all those classic kind of Ianucci, thick of it style, yeah. punch zooms and all of that down on Earth. But we made yeah. sure we sort of never did that up, up on the ship. It was, it was much more... Um, sticks steady cam prime lenses um all right. the way so um yeah i mean i've done a little bit of that kind of back in the day have done for you know we've I've all done a bit of that I, I did a bunch of sitcom stuff and it's um uh, and it and it it is it, because we at the time we were shooting on alexa and you kind of it does those zooms we shoot using short um, um optimos and that those you know which is, i guess where is that kind of the that just previous to that, it would have been on, even if it was HD, it would have been on kind of two third inch chips doing, yeah. uh, using zooms and rather yeah. than it being a prime thing. And actually for the, the speed of your turnover and what you've got to achieve, actually zooms are super useful for that because obviously you've got a very, it's like a variable prime. So yeah. it is good. And I guess what's, what, what makes that obvious difference is having primes with a, a specific perspective and a depth of field and stuff. Yeah, I just, I thought the limitation of primes would sort of force us to be slightly more cinematic and slightly sure. more thoughtful on the, on the ship. Um, and, you know, there were various sort of tactics that I tried to, to introduce to sort of um, make it easier. Uh, and the classic was, let's start with a wide, but a wide would turn into four wides, you know. Right. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you know it, it, we all do it, but it's, let's light the wide. And really, actually, just to go back a bit, that is something I try and do always as I do try to light wides I think probably all do but um, yeah. you know I love to, to light the room for a wide and then work my way in and hopefully not tweak too much you know I, I do I do quite like the challenge of lighting a room and then and then just tweaking as you go in and this just sort of sure. that to the max it was can I light the really? wide and the wide from over there and the wide from over there at the same time wow and then when we jump in is that going to work on that close up and that can work on that close up and what if they do that and what you know yeah. uh, and it came about um building in a bit of safety while still trying to have a little bit of color contrast and a little bit of, of light contrast so yeah. it was always just sort of balancing things out as best i could yeah so did you i mean that takes us to let's uh, takes it takes well, takes us almost to to kind of operators because it sounds like you're almost running a live show but yeah. just start with um what uh what cameras and lenses were you did you decide on and was there a reason that you did that let's talk about that yeah so um when we were in prep was when the the alexa lf um was available and and the 65 and me being a DP, you know, I was like, oh, fun, exciting, new things, let's try that. And, and so we tested the LF, we, sh we, we did all kinds of tests with the LF. Um, but actually HBO uh, had this incredible note, and I, I know, you know, we all do this, you shoot tests and, and sometimes you get these really kind of um, crazy notes that, <laughs> that it's hard to understand. But they had one of the best notes I've ever received that, that they said like, you know, the advantage of the LF, really not the only but one of the biggest advantages of the LF is that is the more shallow focus and when we've got these huge 250 foot sets why would you want shallower focus and it was kind of like yeah you're so right um yeah. so we ended up with the mini um for reliability for I mean I, I've shot exclusively uh you know ARRI cameras for a long time five years mm -hmm. six years right? it's all about the color for me um and I, I just know them you know so the mini yeah seemed like it'd be the most reliable best color um and just not get in the way you know it's it's light for handheld it's quick for steady cam it's just a you know it's a camera we just know and love um and i ended up on the the leica summicrons um I'm, I'm a big fan of the leica um glass so i've shot sort of uh, i think of my last four three of them have been like um we decided to go cron 
instead of Lux for the, the size and weight. Uh, and I knew I wanted to be around a, a two eight, sort of to a four even um, yeah. stock wise. So I just didn't need that one for. Um, so yeah, that's what we ended up on. That's very cool. Okay, so that moves us then, I think, into quite nicely into into operating. I mean, it's it's um, it it feels like uh, you've men I know you've mentioned this before, but it feels like you were running almost a live show. Because yeah. I guess if you weren't operating this and you were running for all cameras, um, that you were, um, I mean, was you were you almost like like studio directing? I mean, how did that work? And then uh, tell us about your operators, because obviously I think that you've you're having to rely on them almost as autonomous beings because they have to Absolutely. have to uh, i mean you can't you know you, you you can't light like you said you can't light for every angle so you need people to 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 help you out a little bit on that tell us a bit about that yeah uh, absolute baptism of fire i'd never done that before, <laughs> uh, genuinely uh so it would be our, our usual setup i mean uh, you know i say it as four cameras at all times we had four cameras available to us at all times mm. and it, it it really it was a case of how many can we get on every on every setup so uh, you know if it were in a tiny room occasionally it would be single or two cameras you know and it would sort of build out from there but uh, yeah a lot of the time it was sort of three to four um and i just had as big a monitor as i could get split into four i had the, the open comms system whatever that's called you know um and it really was a case of i mean at its worst i guess you know it, i'd have the director next to me um with several different directors and some of them would say oh b camera make sure they get this and i just have to say b camera pan to this c camera yeah. go to that B, you know and you really do just have to sort of scan the screen and yeah, it's yeah. just something i had to just figure out as i went along um yeah you know i've got no idea if i'm any good at it but it was just i, just had, to, <laughs> I had to do it you know well, it's kind of fun isn't it i mean i've done a little not, or i have done um, been one of the cameras in multi-operating and I, i've sort of done yeah. a little bit of you know when you're obviously calling it when you're watching two cameras or saying you're uh, and what i found is that or what i've what i what having done a bit of studio stuff is that when directors are basically telling you what what all the cameras are doing yeah and it means that as you as a camera knows what everyone else is doing so you yeah. <laughs> you know that what you're doing is either right or that somebody else has got the shot that you're thinking of so yeah it's a kind of a different skill but it's kind of exciting as well it's kind of there's that yeah. live yeah. aspect to it it's definitely a bit of the seat there's of the a pants. real like there is a real adrenaline to it and and it also just gives you this sort of energy you know you feel mm -hmm. this kind of live wire of, of uh, these actors might do something he might improvise something incredible we might get a reaction and and is a camera going to kind of hit that improv pan across and then get the yeah. reaction and if if you know once it's kind of you build up a kind of all the operators build up with okay they're liking this they're liking this and mm -hmm. they start to kind of throw these things in themselves so it's kind of like an orchestra actually now yes you know? and when it's really working it really is um well it's amazing yeah there's a lot of adrenaline to it um, and it must be a groove as well, I guess. It's everyone, absolutely. you know, after a couple of weeks, everyone starts, you start, I mean, you start getting, like you said about the rules, is that everyone starts getting a sense of the rules yeah. and a sense of the way it's all going and the, those energies. So everybody starts, it must be, it's good fun when it's all up and running. Yeah, exactly. And a typical kind of setup would be, you know, say, say there's two people talking, nice and simple. We would have over and over cross shooting. We'd then maybe have one more over on a tighter lens. And then we'd have a camera in the middle that we, we'd call swingles. Um, yeah. So swinging singles. So, yeah. so that would be bang, 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 bang. And it's the swingles where you get those moments of, of it's, it's watching a tennis, ma tennis match. But yeah. You don't yeah. want to follow every word. You know, occasionally you want to follow a reaction or you want to stay on a reaction. And it's, yeah. um, that's the, the hardest one, I guess. That's the one that you really have to kind of get into a groove. Um, but also you get that with, well, I guess it's it's kind of knowing again. That's part of the groove, isn't it? And it's knowing the script, and it's knowing, and actually working with cast. I guess if they they'll almost yeah. wait for you to hit them for a reaction, or um, but also you can operate that safely because mm -hmm. you know that actually even if you if if you if it doesn't get caught, you know that you've got <laughs> you've got at least one camera that's covering it anyway. So it's kind yeah. of kind of safe. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I've been I've been leaping all around my uh, my, my questions. I'm not in order at all. <laughs> all right. Um, right. Uh, where are we up to? Hang on a second. So, uh, so yes, this. Um, so my well, that was my big question. Is that did you 
and it didn't look like you did having said the how this kind of the pace that you're moving and the way that 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 um armando wanted to cover it was um did you have any fixtures on the floor it looks like you barely did and it was all kind of you know it was all or your or the fact that you could bring your kickers up or or or, or keys or whatever how did that did you have anything on the floor uh, i mean <laughs> once or twice <laughs> yeah so, so, so i i was always always you know the, the constant sort of self-imposed stress was how because i was very aware that i've got to constantly make compromises you know i have to cross shoot i have to be able to give them space all of these things are compromises you have to kind of build in safety um but i was constantly sort of looking for any opportunity to introduce a hard light or introduce any sort of anything that could just elevate it visually that wouldn't get in the way. So I was mm -hmm. constantly looking for an opportunity to put a lamp on the floor or whatever, but the speed we were working and the prep we had done meant that I just had so many sky panels everywhere rigged, you know, hidden right. every which way so that I could kind of do all of that without having to put a lamp on the floor. So right. it would be, okay, they've ended up here, stood wherever the hell they are, um, I think we can get away with turning off everything behind the cameras from, you know, from behind the audience yeah. uh, and just to get some, some near side contrast. And I think we can bring this thing up and this thing up and we can dim this top light and that's going to give us as much shape as possible to where they've ended up. And, you know, I'd be yeah. able to do that occasionally. Then cut to take two and they decide halfway through the scene to turn around and I get called yeah. out, right? So yeah. that, it was always about what can i get away with it really was yes. so so it became about okay if we put the monitors here <laughs> let's sit <directly laughs> here yeah the monitors here let's turn these lights off and voila yeah. we've got a corner of contrast and it means right, right. very unlikely we're going to look in this direction you know and it was just it was always little sort of tactics like that um sure. and and yeah we, we had so i had um in terms of integrated fixtures i wanted you know Simon Bowles had this incredible design where there were no straight lines on the ship. Right. Everything was a curved surface. Every wall, everything was with a curve. And so he, he designed all sorts of different integrated fixtures. Um, sort of, we had these cloud lights, we called them, these sort of... Um, yes, those, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, whatever the hell they are. Uh, then we had the kind <laughs> of more strip lights everywhere, mm. big pillars. All of that all had the same thing in it, which was um, LED, RGB, WW strip, uh, just tons of the stuff. So we had five kilometers of LED, RGB, WW strip. I ordered it from Japan, found this new, you know, source, um, really good stuff. Uh, and we could, you know, that did, was quickly, did you, te did you, did you test that for color before? Did you get a chance to test that? Yeah, so luckily um, I had uh, had a very good, uh, you know, practical um, practical gaffer, practical HOP, whatever, you know, Jamie. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And he, he, he had all kinds of different things to test and there was one clear winner that um, was the brightest, it had the best colour flexibility, it was just really great stuff, it was the newest, um, so we right. just had to order absolutely tons of the stuff um, from Japan. And then every fixture had that in it. So, you know, we were linked up via iPad. Um, we were running uh, Windows. It was like an emulated Windows type setup. I did get all the details of what it was, but I didn't entirely understand it. Um, <laughs> but it meant from my side, I could just say, okay, that cloud light. Uh oh, I'm frozen. Or is it just me? Uh oh. Is that just me that's frozen or is it? Oh, there you go. Oh, no, you go. Was it me or was it you? Everyone's frozen. I don't know. There's some chat. Everyone's frozen. Everyone's good now. Excellent. We're all back. Um. <laughs> well, I can see the chat is furiously going. Hello, everyone. I'm glad you're all still here. That's brilliant. It was Evan. I see. There you go. It was me. <laughs> It was Evan's fault. Excellent. <laughs> Glad to hear it. Um, shall I? Should we have a quick go at the screen sharing thing? Shall I? Show yeah, absolutely. Things? Yes, we've, uh, we've 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 been practicing this, uh, and hopefully this will uh, will come off. But Evan's, uh, we've managed to try and share some of the uh, the behind the scenes pictures that Evan has got. If you take the notice of uh, of whatever he's got on his desktop. Because I think he's closed all the all the secret stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Is has that? worked it is working yeah i've got it full screen now 
And can I can I go through them though? No, I can't. Okay, okay. Um, how can I go through them? Is it okay. just not left and right on your? Uh, it didn't work. Once, then. once, once it's no. Let me. If I full screen preview, I think it will. No. Wow. Okay. Well. Oh, that's weird. Do or down it up and down, up and down. Yeah, that's what I was doing. Uh, okay. Full screen. Up, down, up, down. It's it. Okay. Well, is that? Oh, it's my advice from Mark Purvis there. He's uh, select all with space bar and yep. then arrows because then you just, it's like scrolling through a PDF. So if you select them all. Oh, it's gone to the bottom there. Uh, God, I'm feeling like. I know, it's like 101, isn't it? Here? Yeah, I mean, okay, that's select all. <laughs> and then space bar, right, to preview, but that's taking me there. But it's like, no, let me. Yeah, okay, cool. It's gone into a funny order, but we can make that work. All right, there we go. Okay, cool. So yeah. Oh, I love I this. To... That, these, these are great shots, these, the, the side by sides. Yeah, I mean, so, so as you can see, um, this is looking at um, our biggest set and it's only actually looking at sort of less than half of it. It's very hard to actually describe how big the set was, but essentially behind me, behind the camera, you've got the same again. Uh, in terms of scale, wow. there's a glass elevator there that was working. So you could kind wow. of start up on that upper platform, you know, set a whole walk and talk scene, get into the elevator, go down the elevator, come out again, back up the other side. You know, you could walk and talk this thing for sort of five wow. minutes. Wow. So that we needed the ability to be able to do that. So the pre lighting stage was essential to that. I did a, a two week on camera pre light. I mean, I had pre lighting before that with, with you know, Gaffer and everything else. but. Uh, I had an on-camera pre-light, which was something I, I really pushed for for two weeks. And what I wanted to achieve in that was was, was uh, giving the set different lighting states because, um, as you can see, there's a lot of white on the set. Um, mm. And it, it was a bit of a personal goal that I didn't want that white to ever be true white. I always wanted to kind of play with it. So it's always going to be a little bit warm or a little bit cold. And so the idea came up that the ship itself would have different um, different modes. So, right. you know, you're in space. Um, there's no weather. You know, what dictates data? What what dictates the time of day? So the ship itself would have kind of a day mode, an evening mode, and maybe a night mode. Um, and so that's what we set out designing. So this was our kind of day default look. This is still in prep, so there's a few things not finished. Mm -hmm. uh, this was the evening mode, and this was the night mode. So very sort of basically we had sort of three standard looks um to right. go between just just to kind of orientate the viewer to, to time of day yeah. um and and just just give it a bit more variety you know we just didn't sure. want the set to always feel the same um and what is that just flick through those again is that is that is it just color and then uh, and then keeping highlights but then dropping some of the guts out of it or and i'm guessing that you had a, a, a big old softbox on the top of this so you could drop the ambient down Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's a combination of things. It was, um, yeah, it's, it's very much color, color contrast, uh, mm. color and contrast, <laughs> the two yeah, things, yeah. Really, I suppose. So, so the idea, day was the sort of the brightest, the most mm. neutral colors, reds, the cleanest. I did want to have yeah. a little bit on the warm side though. Um, yeah. This was evening, um, but just things warm up. There's a slight bit less fill, a bit more contrast. And mm. then night, we wanted to do something completely different. Um, the idea was to kind of introduce the idea of moonlight to have a kind of, sort of silvery blue ambience as if it's mm -hmm. moonlight um, and one thing to say as well is that the only real light source we had from off the ship you know was the sun um, but the studio the set was so big in the studio that we decided quite early on to not use sunlight pouring through windows because we wouldn't be able to get backed off you know it wouldn't make sense yes. sure. um, so we decided that the front of the ship had some sort of e-glass, you know, that would filter out the sunlight, but the mm -hmm. back of the ship, the kind of grungier end of the ship, we, we allowed sunlight to pass through windows back there. So we could have a bit Great. Um, of sunlight. So, so yeah, that, that was the sort of the pre-light, which really gave us um, the foundation. Um, and again, that, so just the key, the key stuff on, on, on horror in the foreground is that, that looks like that's something on the floor or is that something that you've got rigged i mean just so that next shot you've got 360s and 60s up in the air yeah so that big soft light there is actually one of our pillar lights um right. one of those in shot so yeah okay we'll see behind oh, okay. uh, the right. bar there 
it's these big pillar lights. Um, so all I did here is just orientate where we were standing so she could right. use that as her key light and you get this right, big, right. soft, controllable light. So yeah, you know, that could have been, uh, you know, a book light or whatever on the floor. Um, yeah. But we just used the fixtures. Um, and yeah, that, 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 you know, quite often in the blocking of things, it was me trying to sort of manipulate <laughs> where they could stand yeah we've all been there absolutely some justification for <laughs> you know if you see behind her actually here on the on the upper deck there's a kind of satin type light on the ceiling if you see what i mean yeah. um yeah. and you know quite often if we were setting a scene up there it'd be, can we put them under that light you know obvious yeah. stuff like that yeah um, sure. there's how, did, a, there's how, how did that go down through. that sort of stuff how did it go you down? know it just depends pretty pretty you know that pretty well that they, they you know ultimately for all the flexibility we tried to give this was set in space so there's all kinds of vfx and there were restrictions that couldn't be avoided sometimes if we were doing a zero gravity spacewalk you know it was pretty much one camera at a time because it had to be just for for safety for, for everything else so yeah there, there were occasionally restrictions we just tried to kind of keep them to a minimum yeah yeah um, and this shot, I think you can see, you can see my fixtures there, yes. the softbox, there's, there's sky panels everywhere. Um, and yeah, this is, this is lifted from the show, but pre VFX. So. Um, right. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's good. I mean, knowing that, you know, all of those things are, you know, the limitations there of the set, I mean, and they're not many, but the fact that you, you can, you know, full well that that's all going to be replaced exactly. gives, yeah. gives you all of that, you know, you can actually bring your softbox down and you can really sort of fire stuff in knowing for, exactly. you, with the safety that you know it's all going to get apart from the guy on the on the left who needs a bit of roto yeah yeah well, you know that, that was a that was a big point of contention is it was it going to be blue screen or black screen and we we ended up with black screen um with actually sequins stitched into it so it did occasionally catch the lights and look like stars so there's a few shots oh i see so it could have been it they like, it could have just then had glass or you know, in, term, yeah, in terms exactly. of what the VFX would be, it could be, exactly. you know, a, a sky dome type affair. Exactly. Yeah, they did have to put glass into everything. Yeah. But um, right. on this big set, we did decide to go black instead of blue or green in the end for various reasons. So, yeah. Right. And I just spotted here, this is, this is my uh, key grip, Reagan Brown, standing in. Right. Uh, I don't know if he's listening, but he might be. Um, and this was actually the set um, in a kind of party mode. We didn't actually ever use this, but this was just putting <laughs> every single every single light on the set into a kind of show off disco mode. Right, um, right. Is this video? Is that kind of play? Oh, here we go. Tech again. I'm, I'm hesitant. Oh, there you go. That was going to play. So there. Is that working? It is. Oh, it's very. Um, there you go. It's a little jutter juddery. Juddery? It's a laughing. <laughs> but that's just showing the scale of the set just in one pan. I mean, and how people, how small the, those people are. I mean, that's it's an enormous undertaking. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And, and yeah, it's the whole and the old disco uh, S60 softbox. Exactly. <laughs> that's yeah. incredible. Yeah. There you go. Lots of fun. Um. Yeah. I mean, and so you had literally, I mean, you, you talked about having a, a iPad control. I mean, and obviously that wireless DMX and that, uh, and you being able to control, pinpoint absolutely every fixture. Is that right? Absolutely right. Yes. Yeah. That's amazing. That's pretty impressive, isn't it? And, but, but I guess really becoming, you know, these days it's becoming more and more standard, but, but, on, but seeing it on that scale is always impressive. Yeah, I mean, it had to be broad strokes, you know, on that, this, at this size, but you can probably see on this shot, I've got a 360 there in the middle backlight that's warmed up relative to yeah. the ones to the left. And that's, I was always trying to, I didn't want to ever sort of sit at a perfect colour temperature where everything's perfect tungsten, sure, sure. the camera's at perfect tungsten. I was always looking for something cooler, something warmer in shot and to have cuts of colour contrast um, mm. at all times. Um, and this actually jumping to the back of the ship is just sort of the, the other end of things. So this was that more grungy environment where yeah. it, this was all about sort of shooting hard lights through grills and, and having yes. all kinds of lights, you know, that, that people could walk through different shapes. Um, this was my, my second gaffer at AJ Walters standing in. Right. Um, and yeah, as you can see here, you know, this is where I could sort of 
be a lot happier on a photographic level with sort of what I was doing in terms of yeah. giving it a lot more shape and sort of just this is more what I sort of normally do um, yeah. but still trying to give an environment that works for everything I said before what was in though because I think I've seen those 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 industrial tube holders I think I've I might have used those myself what, what have you got in those <laughs> well we, yeah yeah we we went so we got all of these sort of rugged looking fixtures which again Simon Bowles was amazing for but um I would put an Astera in it so so pretty much all of those are still LED it's you know the Astera um LED yes, absolutely. Color control. um yeah. And yeah, you know, that could have been a fluorescent with a, a kind of steel blue or peacock or whatever, you know, gel, but for speed, for flexibility. Oh, absolutely. Astera it's it's a no-brainer, isn't it, these days? Yeah. Asteras have, have, have changed the way that I work completely. Yeah. Um, do you want to keep going? Look, that, looks like, that looks like a terrible electrical accident. <laughs> well, this is, <laughs> this is playing with our gravity shift in prep. That's my uh, Steadicam A camera operator, Doug Walsh. Uh, right. who, keenly standing in there um, but this was a set that actually gimbaled um, not quite 90 degrees but sort of just past 45 degrees I think so for, oh I see I've just only just noticed the telephone there yeah. hanging out right okay well this is in prep and it isn't gimbaled yet so that telephone okay. is actually being held by wire <laughs> okay all right just to demonstrate what it would okay. be like when it did gimbal um, yeah but yeah, and this is actually showing, uh, this was from outside the ship looking in and it was just playing around with sunlight. So here's with the sun on, here's with the sun off. Um, mm. And we ended up sort of somewhere in the middle. And this is from, our, uh, this is from uh, a costume test we did um, with the cast standing in, yeah, again, right. that with the daylight. Um, so uh, yeah. It's always about, and I think as part of that reality uh, of trying to find a reality in that and taking it, trying to remove it from the studio, is like you're saying about the, is it having different fixtures that kind of are a bit errant? I always really enjoy what looks like errors, you know, when you yeah, get a bit, a, a bit of a bleed or, you know, a bit of something that's coming out of the side of a, of a, of a lamp. And I, more often times I leave that because it's actually quite natural. You know, yeah. if the, if the, something might just catch on somebody or it's just a glint somewhere and it's once it's got a bit of smoke in it actually that's interesting did you use not that we'll talk about the fire but did you did you use <laughs> did you use any atmosphere um what was my no I, I only used atmosphere on earth that was another because of being in space we wanted it to have this sort of sterile feeling air yeah. essentially um so we decided and for how much vfx there was we just sort of decided it would be fair enough to not have any atmosphere in space yeah. um down on earth uh, we really pumped the rooms um a sort of unsaid joke um was that our man they wanted earth to feel incredibly hot and sweaty um you know there's, there's a lot of sort of things about what's happened to humanity over 40 years in the show that are relatively unsaid and one of them's the right. weather so he wanted everyone to always be sweating on earth and have just sunlight pouring through windows so you know the 18ks came out we had loads of atmosphere and down on earth you know it was a lot more you know well, easier frankly right um to just pour light through windows and sort of play with the warmth i guess yeah. the other thing that comes with atmosphere you know as much as we all love a bit of atmosphere is that it's about managing that and and if you're moving at speed then yeah i mean Stu, if you've got one big studio i guess it's kind of easier because you i say that but it's you, in terms of maintaining levels but also it, it the, you know, I, I mean it, is that you were it's, you're after contrast and actually a lot of a lot of times our, um, atmosphere is obviously pulling down your contrast so if you've got all okay. these kind of soft boxes and soft kickers and soft keys and actually you, you want more contrast rather than trying to flatten it out yeah exactly exactly it was a, the vfx didn't really want the atmosphere i wanted mm. as much contrast as possible and it just yeah. there are enough things that made me thought let's just not have it um yeah so so yeah that's that's what we decided um, oh, here's here's a location actually. So I did have atmosphere here. Um, not sure you can tell, but this was um, this is actually uh, uh, McLaren. This is McLaren's um, head office, I guess, right. um, somewhere in I think Hampshire was it? I think it was Hampshire. Um, right. this, this was pretty much as we found it. Um, we've got our graphic up there on display, and this was it 
lit. But well, it's again, a bit of a, uh, is that is that their lighting rig then? It's a bit of a, it's, a, it's a bit of an Arthur Max. Uh, it's a Doctor Strange love. Yeah, um, <laughs> which really is, a, is that's a gift. That's amazing. Incredible. Yeah, I mean, we had their in-house desk up, and we were able to do everything you see there using um, their their fixtures. I did. I'm pretty sure I probably had a sky panel off camera right here just to sort of pick out Rav a little bit on the stage, but right. you know, one lamp basically. Otherwise that, that was another room that was just lit, um, but this time on location, yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, and this actually, just to point out, this was a cool thing about this, um, was this was a 3D printed set, which I think is a sort of wow. first, I'm pretty sure. I mean, th this was more for Simon Bowles, the production designer to talk about, but he designed these sets in, in 3D, um, we actually had uh, a virtual reality, you know, Oculus Rift that we could use to sort of walk around the sets and look at them in VR. And wow. then the printing process, he was actually printing these with a 3D printer, big pieces of polystyrene that were then reinforced and slotted together like a puzzle. Wow. Um, wow. So that's, that's, a, that's a 3D printed set. Yeah. <laughs> the only... <laughs> Well, that's the only 3D printing I've seen is I uh, worked on a show and they were making robot parts that were probably about this big. So it would have taken, would have yeah. taken months and months. That's impressive. But I guess yeah. becoming more and more normal, especially with that kind of sci-fi stuff, is that you, you need to make something that's, that's utterly unique and unfound yeah. as it is. And so all that sort of stuff needs making. Or you just you're, you know, end up with the age-old things that they've been doing for years, which is ice cube trays and... Yeah, uh, yeah, and and fairy lights poke through her, which works. You know, stuff Absolutely. still works. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I think for this, it was a lot of it was about the curvature. He he wanted to just have this everything having this sure. curved shape, and I think the three D printing really helped with that. Mm. Uh, yeah. yeah, but a lot of white, as you said. But I guess yeah. that's you know that's that's. Uh, I mean, narratively, I guess that kind of works because it's it's that fresh new you know i guess again just going back to references is that there isn't anything quite like this and when you think of, of things that are cruise ship based you know actually yeah. all of those things are very new and very clean and very sort of customer based and it's not yeah. you know it's not all alien is it as much as we'd like to so i, exactly. I, I guess it, but you've already said that kind of idea you've got the front of house and the, the back of house so you did get to do a little bit of that it was very much something I was, I struggled with because, mm. you know, w with all of the things I said about having to light for multi-camera, cross-shooting, everything else, white walls was like another element of sort of almost nightmare. You know, like mm. I, I'm one of those, I, I, I would, I'd love it if there wasn't a single, you know, pure white anything on set you know it should always be a bit off have a bit of something and, and for to have so many white walls was something i really struggled with initially but then i just leaned into that's what it is it's a sterile slightly yeah. sort of vulgar casino cruise ship environment and that is what it would be i guess so this room in particular was actually a multi-faith cathedral type room so again we could just we really could go with the white here and I just decided that, it, you know, it would contrast the more interesting stuff at the back of the ship even more by having it so, sure. uh, so sort of plain, I guess. Um, but yeah, we, we did try to warm it up. That was, that was the main thing. I did want that white to always feel a little bit on the warm side. This set is probably one of the cleanest whites because it was the multi-faith room. But in general, uh -huh. um, they, were, they were usually quite warm. I'll just buzz through to see if there's anything else. I guess the biggest um, thing for all those white walls is then skirting. So, I mean, at that, uh, but and if you can't do that on a shot to shot basis, exactly, that's, yeah. is that trying to skirt, like you said, those cloud, the, the, the cloud fixtures, is it trying to skirt yeah. those to try and darken the walls off a bit? Is, um, always tried to, but there just wasn't, you know, yeah. I, I used, um, you know, egg crates and that sort of thing on, on the sky panel. So I was always trying to kind of, um, you know, hit people and not the walls, but just yeah. the ambient light bouncing around quite often sure. white floors as well. Yeah, it's pretty hard to just keep it off completely. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you want me to jump out on this? I'm, I'm conscious I've sort of commandeered. Oh, no, I think that they've been, uh, they're, 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 they're great to look at. Okay, okay. Well, I, I guess this is just another tone that, that was um, spacewalks. And, and with spacewalks, I decided to just go really, really, really simple and just yeah. have the sun. Um, so that's all single, this is all single source. Um, right. It was, I can't actually honestly remember if it was an 18K. I think it was an, uh, it may have ended up being a 9K for, for not being able to get so far away in the studio, but yeah. something like an 18 or a 9K. Um, 
and we just went single source with it, um, which was great to just sort of simplify things. Um, yeah. For the space world, just one of those. But with stuff. terribly, terribly handy helmet lights. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, they were very well designed. Yeah. This is actually uh, it's a recycle of the space suit, uh, space suit from the Martian. Um, so this right. was really Scott's Martian suit that we had sort of repurposed. Um, just and, put yeah. some new patches on it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> just took Matt Damon's name off it and put. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> um, this is a sports bar. It's kind of hard to explain why this is impressive, but but this was built on the atrium set, which you saw earlier. Right. So um, if you see that, the, the sort of peacock um, teal coloured pillar mm -hmm. there, that was the pillar that was around the bar on that first thing I showed you of, of the lady sitting in. Right, right, right. And so this, this whole set was sort of built into the atrium set. Um, oh, okay. So the ceiling, the walls, everything was sort of put into the atrium and then taken away again. So actually, oh, yeah, wow. the glass elevator at the back there is the glass elevator from the main set, just repurposed. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So I thought, just from an art department perspective, which was that's amazing. Yeah. Pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, so that the 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 column there was that is that are you saying is that is that the ribbon? Is that your RGBWW ribbon? It was. Yeah. It was strips of those ribbon lights just run down to just, and then um, we had a diffusion inside them to sort of soften it out so you couldn't see the right. source. And yeah, that was it. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. So uh, just uh, we we are going to take um, we we'll just uh, talk about another couple of things, and then uh, we are going to take some questions. But if you want to, everyone who's listening, who I think everyone is still there, which is lovely. If there's a little Q and A button at the bottom of your screens in your pop up, hopefully. So if you hit that, I think as as attendees, you can uh, you can put questions in. So it just keeps it separate from the chat. I know there's a, a couple of questions that popped up in the chat. Um, uh, so yeah, if you, if there's any questions you want to put in there, and I'll try and put them to to Evan. Great. Like, uh, okay, cool. Um, I was going to say just before I stop screen sharing, this was the yes. thing I showed you earlier. This oh this yes, a color board that um, this was from. We, we kept this going throughout the shoot. So any new set, any new lighting setup, I'd take one sort of key screen grab from, from my DIT, Sam, as we went along. And we mm. just kept sort of putting it into this montage and filling it out and filling it out. And the idea right. was to just make sure we were really being as rich and colorful as possible. So wow, we pretty yeah, much yeah. on a week by week basis, if there was going to be a new set, we'd sort of look at this and go, you know, we haven't done much. <laughs> or whatever right. it is. You know, gen genuinely, that's what we were yeah, doing. Yeah saying okay we haven't done purple yet so let's go purple and let's right, do right. purple so this was a great I, I i've actually started doing this on everything now just to sort of always keep track of what i've done uh yeah. and, and what i haven't done as well so yeah so actually interest talking about dit so just how did it work with the dit on set and i know that you if you could briefly talk about um i know that you like to to um to work out some show luts before you um uh before you so you've you, you work with with LUTs on on set how does that work and then tell us a bit about how much post you've got to do and um yeah yeah have you still am I back on camera now have you, you are yeah we're back to back to back to you now great um yeah so yeah the way I like to work I I I've been lucky with um being able to do a bit of pre-shooting on several projects and then taking that footage into the post house and created show lots and I got used to that sort of format uh, and we've talked about this between us as well that I, I, I like I like to be able to sort of stand behind what I see on the monitor and say this is it rather than saying it's going to look better than this because I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. So what I try to do is, is shoot the closest to real footage as I can in prep, take that in to the DI, to, um, to the grade. Uh, I was uh, with Dan Coles at Technicolor for this. He was great. Uh, and we started off with uh, uh, a film emulation lot and then tried a few tweaks to that and tried a few things and sort of settled on a look. And then it was a case of trying that in different environments. And it, I was really happy with how it was looking. And it, that kind of became our show LUT. It was one single LUT we used for, right. I think, absolutely everything on this show. I think there was only one LUT, I'm pretty sure. There may have been an Earth LUT once upon a time, but I think we ended up not using it. Um, because like I say, I, I like to have a, a really nice OLED monitor 
light it and say, this is it. And so, you know, the way workflows are now, I, I know that everyone at HBO is going to be seeing the dailies with that lot and everyone's going to see the same image. So if anything ever comes back and there's any questions, you know, is this too dark? Is this too red, too colorful? Mm. I at least know they've seen what I'm standing behind. And I know that's, we're all looking at the same thing. So I've sure. really got into that way of working. And of course, in the grades, we, we tweak things, but we start from a starting point that usually, you know, we're quite happy with. Um, mm. So everything I've shown you so far, I think tonight has been with the LUT on it, but it's from, you know, it's from throughout the shoot. So it's ungraded just with the LUT right. on it. Um, and then, yeah, you know, the grade becomes about, okay, fine tuning, you know, it becomes obviously matching cameras, matching levels, if anything's wandered and then, okay, maybe let's look at the stuff on earth and let's try something a little different on earth. And you sort of, it's a great sort of starting point. Um, so I was able to grade uh, the first, I think, three episodes in person with Dan at Technicolor. And then for the rest of the show, uh, we, I was in New Orleans um, prepping and shooting a movie over there, which I've just finished. Um, and I was long distancing it. So I'd be sent uh, uh, like a, a two gigabyte H.264. Um, we had looked at my iPad to kind of calibrate that to get that as close as possible. You know, it's, it's pretty good actually. And I was able to go through and do time-coded notes and then get a second version, time-coded notes, and sometimes get a third version. So ah. it's was, it was a pretty good system. I was able to do long distance. Um, That's good. Yeah. I mean, the, I would say what I do, the problems that I've had encounter sometimes is on some of the, um, sometimes on the, uh, the daily systems is that once you've, you've had, um, stuff that's gone up and come back down and gone you know once it's been been through the machine a little bit too much it, anything can happen to the color and contrast and it, uh, or, or or if sometimes in the offline things are turned up and all sorts of you know so it can get a bit hairy but yeah. so that's yeah. why i would be i'd be sort of slightly um no, I, I agree with you. I always make a big deal about that. So mm -hmm. I always want to do a test. I want to do a pipeline test. And sure. what we found was we were using PIX, which can be bad, actually, if I'm honest. Yeah. I think Encody and um, whatever the other one's called, Media, whatever, is better. Mm -hmm. But PIX, PIX is hit or miss. But I, we did find that if you put it into full HD, and if it wasn't a green screen shot, it was pretty good. It was sort of 95% there. Green screen shot, for whatever reason, um, something in the way we were processing it was doing horrible things to the color. So I had to kind of say, ignore anything with green screen because it doesn't look like that. Um, oh, okay. But yeah, you know, one, one thing that Sam, my DOT um, from Digital Orchard was doing was the daily screen grabs for me. So, you know, full quality screen grabs. So I always had those as well to refer to as a reference. So, right. um, yeah, we were, we were, you know, we never had any pushback actually, like yeah, HBO were, were happy, Amanda was happy and it was, it was always a positive thing, but Good. just, I always like to make sure I've got that as backup just in case anything comes in, I can say, well, this is exactly what it looks like. So sure. had you worked with Dan Coles before? I hadn't, no, no, it's the first time. Um, Dan did Veep. So he, okay. I'm sure he was probably on the project before me. Um, right, right. He's, great. he's really great. Um, yeah, really good. Brilliant. Right, let's. Uh, we'll just jump to some questions now. Um, uh, there's not hundreds, so that's good. We can. Uh, we'll make it through all of these. So I've got. Um, uh, hello, Evan. How old are you? If you don't mind me asking, what's your favourite colour? That's not what the, one of the questions. I just it feels like <laughs> a bit like it's a bit like swap shop. This. How old are you? Uh, and. How did you get your start? Where did you study? I am 36. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I had to okay. think about that for a second, but I'm 36. I, um, a mere boy. Yeah, so yeah, <laughs> I've, I've come up the un, uh, untraditional route. So I, um, I studied business studies at university and went down a whole different, you know, idea of what I was going to do with my life. Without doing the whole life story, I ended up in a marketing department shooting corporate videos. Um, that led to doing short films. Uh, I did, um, well, I've done over a hundred short films. So, so my wow. sort of version of film school was I decided that I want to be a cinematographer. I, I tried to do the assisting route and I just, I was too focused on, on wanting to learn lighting and wanting to shoot things. And I just knew I sort of decided I'm going to be, I'm going to start off as the worst DP 
in the world, in the UK, but I'm a DP and I'm going to sort of learn and learn and learn and learn and just keep learning and keep trying things. So I went through a period of shooting short films, shooting every single genre I could find, you know, whatever it was, just to sort of keep shooting and keep learning. And after over a hundred shorts, um, I got my first feature, very low budget, another feature, another feature, another feature, an agent. And I've just sort of kept, to be honest, blagging it since then. Maybe that's the way I've done it. Um, it's very much I think we've all done, we've all, uh, all, been, all done that, I think. But yeah, I, I, I got, I, I did think about going back to film school and doing it that way, but I was just already up and running and mm. I got lucky with a few things that had turned out pretty well. And, you know, it just sort of kept happening and kept going. And I didn't want to, uh, my route was what I did. I just decided this is how I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do it my way. And I'm going to, I read, you know, all of the sort of classic cinematography books. I very much did my homework, but I, I wanted to sort of do things my way rather than potentially learning the correct way to do it. I just thought it would be more interesting to kind of come at it with a different attitude so mm -hmm. yeah there is no right way we're all doing we're all doing it right <laughs> and we're all doing it wrong i guess yeah i, I agree <laughs> <laughs> um okay that was kind of covered that question as well and that question's kind of been done um just what was your it's one from harry fleet which um what was your approach to lighting for vfx and cg action sequences uh, which including ships coffins and turds did you have much input <laughs> with great the effect? Yeah. Um, yeah, so we didn't have any miniatures. So for all of the, the, the stuff with the spaceship, that was pure CGI. I mean, Simon, the designer, had, had mapped out exactly what the ship was. He had a 3D model. He printed this model of the ship. It was a beautiful thing. I just always pushed. It, it was about communication, really. Um, I wanted it to feel, I, I didn't want, I wanted it to feel like the sun is in the sky and this ship is moving through the abyss of space and there's loads of contrast. And I always came at it from the most cinematic, almost realistic, you know, route possible. And then that, that was just my side of the argument, you know, and, and um, you know, there's obviously other voices and we sort of came to uh, a solution that everyone was pretty happy with, I think. So, yeah, I, I tried to stay involved as much as possible through prep, but, you know, uh, through post, sorry, but you know, it can be difficult on other jobs and whatever to, you know, I'm not getting sent daily VFX tests. So it just had to be a kind of clear, this is what I think we should do lighting wise for that sort of stuff. Um, and yeah, it, I, I always just said, everything I've lit of all the spacewalks is single source. I've just got a sun mm -hmm. and nothing else. So yeah. if we cut to a wide of the ship and it feels completely different, it'll feel completely different. So sure. yeah. Um, ah, very good. Um, uh, sorry, just got to catch up on these. Uh, just quickly, just um, just one from Mark Lobato. How, how, how are you? Um, it, interesting to hear a little bit more how uh, you walked the wire of trying to influence the blocking of actors in the uh, in the midst of was there, was there a lot of improv and uh, and how did you? I mean, how do how do you how do you get to shoot that sort of stuff? Yeah, loads of, loads of improv. I mean, I, I I think in terms of influencing blocking, there's a few tactics I like. Um, one of mine is you know when I'm watching a rehearsal take shape, if I start to feel like okay, the wide from where I'm standing here is going to give me what I think I need for all the angles and I spot the director is watching from completely the other side of the room, I will try and bring them round to where I want them to watch the rehearsal from. So they start to orientate the scene from that position as well. I think that's a good tip or whatever. Yeah. Uh, uh, so there was a lot of that of, of, you know, I think what they're doing here works great from here. Um, occasionally it was, okay, they're doing this here. What do you think if they moved it? 10 feet this direction for this benefit it will speed us up yada 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 you mm. know that's a conversation and then uh, i'd also credit my operators a lot um you know doug walsh was a cam and, and steady cam and he's great working with actors to you know once you've got the shape of it it's just those small little things of just making everything work on a technical level and i think mm. all my operators were really great for feeding in and just being you know, it was a very uh, fun shoot, you know, um, very funny. Everyone was very, very nice. And I think 
all of my crew had a really difficult technical job to do and they they sort of balanced that really really well so i, I credit my operators a lot for the blocking as well yes yeah well they have to um they have to take a lot of that front end load especially if you're if you're you know if there's a lot of lighting or trying you're trying to work stuff out it is that's where operators really stand in step up Absolutely. and are, do wonderful work that you know they take up all of the take a lot of the heavy lifting out for for, for dps which is awesome and we love them for it yeah i mean I, I actually used to be a very much the operating is the soul of what i do as a cinematographer mm. and i've got to operate and i always want to operate and having done have any five where i didn't touch the camera really um mm. and now i've just done a film in new orleans for netflix uh, in the american system where i wasn't allowed to operate really um i i now am completely the other direction i don't think i'll operate again i i'm i love, really wow. i love the freedom now to step back and really concentrate on the lighting and talk with the director and not have to kind of get into the nitty gritty of is it babies or, or, or tools do you know what i mean yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. once you sort of work with an operator who's good who you can trust they just mm. do so much for you to liberate your your time absolutely you know? um and I, i've learned that quite recently so I'm a, I'm a convert yeah yeah no absolutely i mean i did my, my um who was one of my first operators uh uh, Luke Redgrave was one of my first operators, and Vince McGann. I think Vince is here somewhere. Hello, oh, Vince. Right. Um, and and uh, yeah, when you when you when you get the opportunity, you know, I was, uh, it was giving the opportunity to do that. And uh, I, I remember my f first reservation being um, kind of, uh, you know, will they do what I what I would do? And actually, what yeah. you realise is that they really quite quickly get into tune with what your approach is and. Uh, and actually then do, uh, you know, both, both Luke and Vince actually do what I would do, but, and then add extra to it. So it's just, it's, a, it's a joy to find people like that, um, uh, to, uh, that actually it, it's, it's so valuable and it adds, it adds another level of, to, to the whole project. Um, so yeah. another, um oh, there's one from mark Patton, bsc here who was so what was the director's idea behind having a 360 set i mean it was that what's that i mean i mean that sort of goes back to the very beginning really but how does that i mean obviously there's a speed thing and a kind of was it for the benefit of the actors or for i mean what could could you have done it any other way i think i suspect that you probably couldn't we did, we, I don't think we had the time to, but it's also um, Armando is, the way Armando works is so, he's so, um, what am I trying to say? He, he, he's brilliant, <laughs> but, and slash but, he changed his mind very quickly. So, oh. so we could actually genuinely, we could be about to shoot on a set, a scene, and he might say, actually, the scene works better over there. And the thing is, he's right, you know, like it's, it's, it's the sort of thing that in theory you could lose your mind over. But the thing with Armando is he's sort of always got the best idea. Um, sure. So quite often it would be, okay, actually, let's do this over here. Or even actually, so one, one, one very tiny gripe is, is the opening shot of episode one of Avenue 5 is we push into the spaceship um, and it's red and then it changes to a normal colour. And after all of these pre-lights and everything else, that was one where Armando said, oh, it'd be cool if the lights were red. This is before we're about to roll. So it was a, it was a okay, it's going to go red. So give me five wow. minutes, you know, okay. change it to red, have a look at it. I guess that's fine. Put in a transition. And then we pushed in, pressed the button, and it goes from red to, to neutral. And obviously, I'd have loved a bit more time to fine tune that, but the idea was planting a seed for a joke later on so again right, right. he's right to do it you've just got to yeah. sort of be flexible so well and, and obviously you can uh, um, uh, with with that kind of with led and with with, with uh, kind of wireless dmxing and and, and yeah. all those systems that we've got now is actually the fact that you could do that that quickly i mean was he surprised by how quickly that happened or is it, is it just an expected thing now it was for, for random reasons we ended up shooting that scene like a month or two later i can't if i'm honest remember why we may have introduced a new character to that scene so it may have been a reshoot or a pickup for that opening which i can't exactly remember but i think by that point he had realized what we'd 
created that you could just say make that light red and it would take three seconds and it's red yeah yeah so we'd sort of given him i guess that that luxury and he used it which is what it was for so yeah yeah now uh there was a question from earlier um that i have we've i've misplaced it's from ashley baron ashley oh, I remember it. yeah but yeah. you remember what that question was uh, could you, or maybe Ashley, could you repost it in the Q and A uh, question box up there? That would I be think awesome. I can remember it. If, unless yeah, go for it if you if you can. I'm pretty I'm pretty sure it was about the, the lighting in episode nine um, at the end of the episode, um, and it was asking. How oh I... yes, there we go. I've got it. Uh, okay. I've just been handed it to me by a glamorous assistant. Uh, how did you decide on fixture placement? Uh, and what and where were they for the last scene of Ep Nine, where they're arguing about who goes gets in the shuttle? Yeah, so so that was always I was worried about that scene because we had I think fifteen of our main numbered cast mm. in one scene for a fifteen minute scene, basically, um, all talking about it. Three sixty. I knew it was going to be this sort of mass of people, people running in, running out, this whole thing, and I wanted it to also feel grungy, like the back of the ship. So. The real idea there was it was a box, you know, it was a, it was a four wall set, um, was to have hard lighting, um, backlighting as much as possible, but keeping off of people's faces. So we were arcing, uh, you know, the hard lights so that they'd be catching people from behind, but falling on a hard enough angle so it wouldn't hit the faces of the people in front of them, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah, so yeah. Sort of backlighting all the way around the set and then side lighting the sky panels in between. So, you know, we just, to be honest, we just took a stab at, okay, let's put a, a hard light here, there, that, you know, we, we just took a guess, mm -hmm. put some sky panels in, had a pre-light half day, I think, um, set levels, set colors, and that's what we ended up with, yeah. yeah but did you, did you have that, I mean, I've done that before, where I actually in, in the warehouse in Free Fire, is that yeah. I didn't have it quite at the beginning, but that was again that was something it was a large space that i almost had to have lit for 360 mm -hmm. um, but i ended up with a with a real it's you know it was a real a real warehouse with no grid but just ended up with it was a 14 foot there was a ridge 14 foot up and yeah. i ended up with a ring of pups like yeah. around this entire building i just that then i could there was always a kicker somewhere you know wherever everyone stood so i guess you end you either develop that or if you know that you're stepping into it then you have uh you just try and put a kicker in wherever you can. So at least there's some yeah, shape. It's basically the same thing. I mean, I, I, yeah, exactly that. And I would try to turn off the near side hard light. Yeah. yeah. Could. And quite often I couldn't because, they, right. you know, because it was 360, but you know, I, I would, I would say let's have a wide and let's have two other wides either side of it. Mm -hmm. And let's turn off everything above me so that at least right. I'm not front lighting for the yeah, wires. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, did you yeah. even, were you bringing, did you ever bring in uh, black drapes or did you ever, you know, even because they're relatively quick to move or did you not have any of that at all? Not, not really. We, we really did move very quickly, wow, unbelievably yeah. quickly at times. You know, we, we, we had eight to 10 page days. Um, wow. We had crazy days. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, I'm sure I did occasionally, but it, but it was rare. Um, yeah, it was rare. Mm. Yeah. And uh, just quickly then, um, some, uh, Thomas Terminet Choupon has asked, um, how do you get a, go about picking your operators? Um, and uh, I mean, did you, you talked about Doug being your, was your A camera and your Steadicam operator. Did, yeah. How did you, who else, who else was there? So yeah, so because I, I've worked my way up the way I described, I, I've had, I've, I've been really lucky with crew and I've tried to keep crew, you know, if I work with someone I like and who is good, I try to sort of cling on to them. I've, I've brought up this really great crew with me over the years so um operators as i said is a role that i didn't tend to to, to use previously yep. but yep. steady cam would be the exception to that so so doug walsh um was my steady cam operator eight years ago or something like that on a film called confine and i've, I've worked with him um as much as possible since then um but then the idea i had for sort of b and c camera was a little bit unorthodox because there was going to be some second unit shooting um sporadically and we started talking about the idea of having an operator who could also dp so what i actually what i actually did was sort of speak to a couple of my friends who are also young dps who are sort of you know rising stars upcoming um mm -hmm. and got them to step in as operators who could also 
DP for me. So Aaron Rogers, um, he's with me at Casa Rotto, been friends for a long time. Um, he came on as sort of a C camera operator who could also be our second unit DP as and when we needed. So initially it was just little of the effects elements, but that grew and grew to sort of full mm -hmm. scene shooting by the end. Um, and James Rhodes, the same thing, you know, he's a DP in his own right, absolutely, but uh, came in to sort of operate B camera. And again, he did some DPing uh, at the end when we were double banking in second unit. Um, and then uh, I, I always made sure we had a second steady cam operator. So um, Mahalis started off as our, our, our steady cam operator for that. Um, he had to, to leave at one point and then we replaced him, I think initially with Stamos for a while. And then it was Andrew, um, Andrew, Andrew Bainbridge, I want to say his name is. Sorry, Andy, if you're watching. Um, and several other dailies who came in. Right, right. So, yeah, I had, I had a core team of four and the focus pullers and the loaders below that I've worked with for years as well. Yeah. Um, it's a big old team. Lots and lots of people. Lots of people. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Electricians. Did you, did you do any, I know you've done it before, did you do any gimbal work at all? Yeah, yeah, we did. Yeah, um, uh, we, we had a Movi on. We ended up not using it too much, actually. I'm not sure that will come back for season two, but um, because we had Steadicam, because we had, you know, Doug or Andy, Stamos, Mahalis, we, we could always jump on Steadicam. And quite sure. often we'd have two Steadicams going at the same time if it was that kind of a scene. Um, so at that point, the Movi became, you know, we, we didn't use it too much, actually, in the end. Occasionally we'd use it as a remote head. Occasionally there'd be a sort of a handover or clever shot, but they were quite rare. So mm. yeah, not too much. Is that, is that movie yours? It used to be, but it burnt in the fire. So Oh shit. So <laughs> yes, let's briefly, briefly to, to sort of, to wrap it up, let's, um, it's uh, heartbreaking. Can you just tell us a little bit about the incident that happened at Leavesden? Yeah. So, so and, what, our, and actually what sort of effect it had on the show. Yeah, sure. So, so our big set, um, uh, at Leavesden, the one that I showed the pre-light for previously, it was, it was the P stage. Um, so it's, I think it's 250 feet by 100 feet by 150, something like that. It's, it's huge. Um, we, we had about, uh, I want to say six weeks to go on the shoot. We had three episodes to shoot, so maybe it was two months to go. Uh, and yeah, I woke up at 5 a.m. Uh, to a text message saying, um, there's been a fire, please don't come to work today. Um, <clears throat> turned out that there'd been a, a fire we don't actually know what happened why um but the entire set caught fire it burned for 15 hours um the sprinklers were on that entire time so not just the damage from the smoke and the flames um the water you know as you saw it's a very yeah, ceiling yeah. set so that water yeah. was, was you know wreaking havoc as well apparently when they opened the door there was like two feet of water that poured wow. out from the stage or whatever so um, really a disaster, it completely decimated our biggest set, um, which, yeah, you know, initially felt like a really big problem, but actually we only had one day off. Uh, we came straight back in the day after that. Right. We were lucky to have other sets and other stages, so we could, we could sort of carry on working. And um, we were also lucky to have great writers who just very quickly looked at what we had, looked at what we had coming up, and they just restaged everything. The, yep. the fortunate thing was we shot slightly out of sequence. We had already shot episode eight and used the atrium. And so we had episodes seven, nine, and 10 to go. So 10 was lost. And so it became seven and nine. We had to shoot without the atrium. But because eight featured the atrium, you know, it kind of felt like it wouldn't be there, then it's back, and then it wouldn't be there. So I right. hope people wouldn't actually notice. And I think like most things, you know, nobody was hurt is the first thing to say. Everything was insured. So, you know, I don't want to say it was a good thing, but it, but it, it did force us to be more creative. It opened up new sets. It sent us out on location. Mm -hmm. And it probably gave us a, a richer, you know, palette. Right. Uh, Whereas otherwise we always would have had this big atrium set that's just easy mm -hmm. to walk into and use. So they're, they're in the process of rebuilding it where they were before the shutdown um, for season two. Um, but it was, yeah, it was pretty devastating at the time. Which actually is a, uh, Stephen Murphy, BS, who's asked a question. If you did, uh, if you, I don't know if anyone's talked to you about season two, would you consider doing it? Have you been talking to them about that or um, would you yeah. change anything? Is there, would there be plans to change anything, do you think? Yeah, so, so I, um, yeah, I, 
I've been offered season two and I, I, it's very much my intention to do at least the pilot. So because of the burn, I do feel like I want to kind of reestablish because so much of the work was setting up the atrium and now it's completely gone. Um, and yeah, I mean, like creatively, I always like to kind of move forward and try new things. So if I'm, you know, if I'm honest, I wouldn't normally want to do a season two or like I, I've been lucky in my TV that I've always done season one, episode one. I've always established things because yep. that's how I know how to work. I know how to work with directors and create. I don't think I'm the sort of DP who could slot in and carry on someone else's work. I'm just not wired like that or whatever. Mm -hmm. So for this, I just thought it would be great if I came back, did the pilot for season two, set it up again, and, and then handed it over um, to, two, to one or two more DPs to kind of carry on. So that's the current plan, but with, um, with what's happened in the world, yeah, yeah, sure. who knows, you know, I mean, I was due to start um, prep, I think in four weeks, um, but who, who knows now? Yeah. So yeah, wow. it's, it's very much my hope to do season two, episode one at least, yeah. And I guess it, I'm not sure. I don't know. I depend on what the what the uh, what the writing is. But if the if you've got reestablish, that's the thing with the sitcom is that actually not many things do change, do they? And you're, what you need to set up is that same situation. Yeah. So I guess it, like you say, it, it does make total sense to to go in and rebuild that principal set because it needs yeah. putting back to the way it was. That makes sense. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, just a quick last question from Oliver Curtis, BSC. How challenging was it to maintain a consistency of focal length for different types of shots, given the multi-camera setup? Single character close-up or a two-shot? Presume occasionally a wide shot would develop into a close-up. How much of that was there? Or was it, or, or, you know, there's always a formula to, to that sort of coverage, which is relative, which is fast and practical, you know, where you sort of, like you said, you, did, you were doing three or four wides, did you often then develop into, I've not seen the entire series, did you no, do a lot of developing? We didn't do too much developing, no. Um, no. Okay. We, we tried to occasionally, but not really, no. I mean, usually I love to sort of get philosophical about lens choice. You know, I, I, I love to sort of talk about this feels like wide and close for these reasons. And I love to visual storytell and use lenses properly. I think on a show like this, there's a practical side to things that's hard to avoid. We had two sets of Summicrons across four cameras. So you could have two 50s and two 75s at the same time, for example. So there was always, uh, you know, there was, I think you fall into patterns, you know, it, mm -hmm. it would be, okay, we like how wide's are feeling on the 29 and the 21. And at the same time, let's throw on a 40 for a medium wide. And you kind of get into those patterns where it's like that feels like what the show is. And then, you know, I'd say the 40 mil came out quite a lot. We, we you know, we, we just, that just felt like our show. We didn't really get wide and close and we tried it to avoid anything too telephoto. So, you know, from sort of 29 to 75 was really the show. And then it just, it, partly it was practical. How do we slot these all in and not see each other? You know, it just has mm -hmm. to be in and then at other times it was like, okay, this moment means this. And so we should be here on this lens. So, you know, back in my mind, it was always visual storytelling. What can I do to just add to visual storytelling? But there was very much a practical element that we talked about sure. as well. That, that was and you had, you had, uh, how many directors were there? Seven, seven. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And then, so that would, it sounds like you were doing, I think you've told me before is that you were, it was, sounds like quite an American system in that you were, Armando stayed there, didn't he? He was there throughout, even if he wasn't directing. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the classic setup was Armando had his monitor, the director had their monitor in the middle, and then I had my monitor on the other side. So the three of us would always be there. So Armando, everyone loves and respects him so much that we didn't have any directors who were trying to come in and change everything. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> you know, and that Made can their happen. mark, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that can happen. You know, and obviously everybody wants their episode to be the best and that's great mm -hmm. because you can approach every episode as honestly, let's try and make this episode the best and it does reinvigorate yeah. you as a DP, I think. But yeah, I, I mean, I did say he wanted me to kind of protect the image. He wanted to make sure, you know, it was my job to make sure we had a consistency throughout mm -hmm. our which was which was great but like i say the directors were very much on board with that so it, it, was, it was a different way of working in a lot of ways it was it was they could very much concentrate on the actors performance and, and the words 
and almost come to me and say, well, what do you think? And it would be like, well, you know, th this is kind of what we do. We'd probably do this and do this and do this. What do you think? And mm. sounds great. And we'd, we'd go. So, um, yeah, it, it was good. All of them were great. Did you enjoy making it? Very much. Yeah. I mean, that was the, the main thing. I mean, you know, I think what we do as DPs is stressful. I, I really do. I think we, we, we bear the weight of a lot of responsibility and a lot of the time we feel like no one knows that. <laughs> do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And uh, on this one in particular, it was such a funny set with such incredible improv oh, yeah. and the actors are just, there wasn't a bad person there. It was absolutely mm -hmm. amazing. And, and I became the butt of a lot of jokes in the best possible <laughs> way. I mean, a lot of the pre-roll where they were doing vocal warm-up exercises, I told them that my wife found those funny when we were watching the, the rushes. So suddenly they became all about me. Uh, right. You know, there's that kind of thing that's constantly going on that as stressful as, uh, I think all the stress was self-imposed is kind of what I'm trying to say. I, I, I wanted to make sure I was doing something I could stand behind and was interesting mm. with all of this sort of adversity stopping me from doing it essentially. But then I'd sort of get pulled out of that little bubble by the, an actor being incredibly funny. And it was really, really fun. I think for my crew in particular, it was one of the most fun jobs they've done. So it was great. Evan Bolter, BSC. Thank you so much for joining us and for, for giving us all that, that was amazing behind the scenes stuff and, um, and for being, the first person on our inaugural uh, zoom q a which i think has worked a treat um thank you so much for being here thank you to all of our uh, um audience who we've still got a, still got a, a few of you left which is very exciting thank you so much for tuning in we're going to do this again hopefully because i've right. um this is uh seems to work so far so thank you ever so much evan um stay safe Thanks, and stay healthy you um else as well and to everyone out there, stay safe and healthy, and uh, and I hope you've enjoyed this, and we'll see you next time. Thank you so, much. so much. Cheers, Take Laurie. Care. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.